Jesus is the only answer for what you're going through. And he's available for you this morning. Amen? Amen. Amen. I also bring that up to state this. We are in a spiritual war. We are in a spiritual war. At the same time, the good news in this is we have been given authority through Christ for our victory. Did you know that? That despite whatever you're going through, the Lord Jesus has bestowed authority on you, which all but guarantees the victory for whatever war you are going through and battling through. Now, something to behold in that is that while you are given the authority, you have to act upon that authority for something to change. I could be given keys to a brand new car. Unless I put those keys in the ignition and turn it on and drive it, what use is it? We've been given authority because we are going through some spiritual battles. And the victory is ours in Jesus' name. Go to Ephesians chapter 6 this morning, and I want to explain some more of this. Last week, as you guys are going there, last week we talked about how while we're going through some physical battles, oftentimes there are spiritual battles following alongside with that. And it's very needed to be aware that while we battle things in life, work, family, circumstances, there are things on the other side that oftentimes we are not aware of or see they're also battling with us. And we have been given the authority by Jesus Christ for victory in these things. I'll explain as we go along a little bit more. But let's start in verse number 10 of chapter 6 in Ephesians. It says, finally, be strong, be strong. How do we get strong? Well, we just talked about it in Isaiah. It is his strength and his power. Be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the evil, the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, therefore, because we battle with these things, therefore, Take up this whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. I love, I love the voice next to me. Do you know why I love that voice? Because she's memorizing the scripture. And she's speaking it right now. I love that. And when you've done all, stand firm. Stand therefore, meaning stand. Stand up where you're at, having fastened on the belt of truth having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as sh shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And in all circumstances, take up this shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. How many? All. all. Take up the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Authority in Jesus' name praying at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert with all perseverance, making supplication for all the saints. Mm, the armor of God. For the next seven weeks, we're going to dive into the armor of God as we wrap up this Set Free series. And he talks about these specific pieces that the Roman soldier would put on to prepare for battle and to go out and to fight. And he brings some spiritual truths to this. So we're going to go into all of these pieces of the armor of the next seven weeks. And we're also going to take a look at how David would have applied these things. David, as we're moving along in the Israelite journey from slavery in Egypt to peace under the reign of Solomon, David goes out and he finishes the job that the Israelites did not finish 400 years earlier and wiping out the giants of the land. And he brings it to a place eventually through his son, Solomon, being able to reign in peace because he 
put on this armor and he went out and he fought these battles and these battles while physical, yes, indeed, there was also a lot of spiritual stuff going on. This is a spiritual battle just as much as it was a physical battle. And so as we go through this, we'll take a look at David, how he did this, but ultimately also what we're going to do, I hope you're tracking with me because there's a lot of stuff I know. We're ultimately going to look to Jesus. David was a type of Christ. He was paving the way for Christ. He was the king, but he was not the king to come. We're going to look to Jesus in this armor of God and how he himself has prepared for us to take this on. So today it's fastened by truth. We're taking up the belt of truth, guys. Are you ready? Are you all ready to fasten the belt of truth around the waist this morning? Yes. You got it? Say, I got it. All right. Go with me to Psalm 25. Psalm 25, we're going to get there in just a moment. As you're going there, there's a picture of here of, of David and King Saul. You see how I, I, I told you that it's oftentimes we're going through a physical battle, but there's also a spiritual battle assigned to that physical battle that the enemy wants to take us out with. Example of this, Philist the Philistines, which David had to go out and finish the job and get rid of those Philistines. Why did he have that task? Because they were the giants of the land that remained in there. They were the seed of the serpent. They were there to mess up humanity so Christ would not be able to come through the bloodline in which he was promised. And so while he was fulfilling the physical conquests of removing that, he was also removing the spiritual stain so that there would be no more of that. Another example of the physical and spiritual working in tandem is this right here, where we know that Saul multiple tri times tried to kill David, whether he's literally throwing his spear at him or he's hunting him with his army. And while that is a physical confrontation, we also know in the Bible it states that the Lord left Saul and in place came an evil spirit. And it was this evil spirit that came upon him that caused him to start acting in this way of madness. So David was fighting something physical, but know that he was also fighting something spiritual. And when we go through something physical, be aware of it. There may be something in the spirit that we need to fight as well. And so we come to this place in Psalm 25 where most scholars agree that David wrote this as a plea to God when he was fleeing from getting the spear thrown at him and fleeing to the prophet Samuel who had anointed him to be king. He flees to him and he writes in Psalm 25, he says this in the New English translation. He says, make me understand your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. This crazy guy is after me, and I don't understand what's going on. I was called into his palace to serve him. I've been anointed to eventually take his place, yet this guy is a lunatic. He's trying to kill me. I don't understand, God, what is going on. So he pleads with God, make me understand your ways. Teach me your paths. Guide me into your truth and teach me. For you are the God who delivers me. On you I rely all day long, all day long. God, you are my source, you are my strength. I rely on you all day long. When we don't understand things, we begin to try and seek out truth. This person that I read about this morning was trying to seek truth. The problem was he didn't go and pray like David did and said, make me understand your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. He went down a different path. And when we don't understand what the truth is and what is going on in our life, we need to be like David in this moment and say, God, I don't understand. I don't understand why this is happening to me. I don't understand necessarily what is going on. But make me understand. Teach me, O oh Lord. Does this resonate with anybody this morning? It says, guide me into your truth, your truth. Jesus is truth. Not what some yoga instructor says, not what some spiritual guide says, but into your 
truth. It's God's truth. And eventually, we get delivered from our unknowing, our confusion. Because it says, you are the God who delivers me. Sometimes you just need to say it. The word of God has to go forth from our mouths when we don't feel like, I can make it, I can do it, and I don't understand what is going on. God, you are my deliverer. And it's on you, God, that I rely all day long. If you're tired and weary and weak, ask yourself the question, have I truly relied on God all day long? He's there for you this morning. He's there for you. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 11. We're going to make our way around the Bible this morning. Does this make sense so far this morning? We're after the truth. We're putting on the belt of truth this morning. And what happens in Isaiah chapter 11 here is Isaiah is prophesying about a coming king. Yes, David was going to be king, but he wasn't the Messiah king. He's prophesying about a future king in Jesus, Isaiah is. And what's interesting, I don't know if you knew this. I actually just recently found this out myself. When it comes to the armor of God, we know that it describes the Roman armor that they would put on. But did you know that throughout the Old Testament, especially in Isaiah, that the armor of God is mentioned? Paul knew the Old Testament better than anybody else alive, most likely during that time. And he knew it so well that when he put together the armor of God, it wasn't just only about the Roman soldier, but he's drawing from the Old Testament. And when it says specific things in Isaiah like, the breastplate of righteousness, the helmet of salvation. It actually says these words that Paul copies. And so we get to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, and he says, speaking of Jesus, righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. So Jesus is already being proclaimed that he is going to put on a belt it's going to be righteousness and faithfulness that endures forever. The everlasting truth will be around the waist of Jesus. So when we're putting on this belt, we're putting on Jesus. We're putting on Jesus because what is the belt of truth? It's truth. Truth. What is truth? Anybody know what truth is? It's not the right question to ask this morning because it's not what is truth. Who is truth? Who is truth? We know this by John 14, verse 6. You can flip there real quick. Jesus is having a conversation with his disciples after he's washed his feast. They're about to enjoy a last supper together. And he proclaims this to his disciples. He says, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. It's been proclaimed this morning time and time again where there stood a wall that made a way. That way is Jesus because he proclaims it. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And this means it's not my truth. It's not your truth. It's not your friend on Instagram and their truth when they're posting about this is my truth. This is my truth. There's only one truth, and his name is Jesus. Jesus lived on earth and he enacted every instruction from the Father. He obeyed every command from the Father. He loved perfectly. He taught truthfully and he lived every moment faithfully. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And we must learn from Christ this morning. We must learn from Jesus himself this morning because when it says in God's word that we read in Ephesians 6, 14, put on, fasten this belt of truth. It literally means fasten yourself with Jesus because he is the truth. Have you thought about it that way before? 
But you're literally putting on Jesus around your waist. This means that we are being very aware that we put the belt of truth around our waist. We're putting on the mind of Christ, putting on the heart of Christ, or putting on the ways of Christ. You are literally picking up Jesus and strapping him around your waist to hold you firm. Somebody needs to know this morning because you are tired, you are weary, you are lost in your ways. The way is to be picked up. And his truth is to be put around your waist. And he will lead you from your misunderstanding to your understanding. He will lead you from your confusion to clarity. He will lead you from weakness to strength. But we must pick up Jesus this morning. Now, I'm going to come back to in a moment how we pick up. Because if you're like me, you've heard the armor of God talked about before. But you're like, how? Like, really, Ryan, how, how do I put on a belt of truth? Like, how do I pick up this breastplate of righteousness? How do we actually do these things? I want to make sure that we understand how, but first we need to understand a why behind everything here. Y'all ready for the why? I can tell there's a lot of contemplating going on this morning, and I can tell that Jesus is working through some things this morning, and I'm okay with this. This is good. This is so good this morning. A little bit about the belt that would be on the Roman soldier. This belt was fastened. What it would do is it would be held, it would be there to hold the sword that they would fight with. It would be there to hold food provisions for them. It would be held, it would be there to hold um, the, the different pieces of their armor, yes, but it also kept everything else into place. Um, I thought about it. It's, it's much like we, maybe we've advanced. If, you, if you're a hiker, you put on a backpack, and that holds your food, that holds your provisions, that holds the things that you carry. Back then, it was this belt. So if you need to think of something else, and, and perhaps you think of a backpack, it, just, it holds everything together. Everything that you need is found wrapped around that belt for where you're going and what you're doing, and this is what truth is in our life. It is everything that you need to move forward in life. When you put the belt of truth around your waist, you are strapping on Jesus, his way, his truth, to lead you to hold everything in place. And if you don't put on the belt of truth and you try to go out and live this Christian life, what do you have to hold yourself together with? And things will creep in. And things will sound good. You see, when, when, when you put on the bells of truth, you can discern what lies are. You understand that? Without a belt of truth, how do you know what's truth and what's a lie? Because the enemy, believe me, he's very cunning. He's very smart. He didn't go up to Eve and go, hey, guess what? God didn't say this at all. He didn't go at it like that. He moves in in his sly, cunning ways. And instead of saying, God did not say this, he goes, did God really say? Did God really say it's not okay to have those crystals in your house? Did God really say it's not okay for you to look lustfully upon somebody else? Did God really say? If we don't have the belt of truth around our waist, we could get caught in going, huh, I wonder if God really did say that. Did, and we can start going down this path. But once we have the belt of truth around our waist and we know who the truth is, what he represents, his way, then we get to go, that's a flat-out lie. I rebuke that. I exercise my authority in Jesus Christ, and I cast that lie to the pit of hell. Somebody needs to do this this morning. You need to pick up Jesus, and you need to strap him around your waist so that you walk in the way of truth. So when the enemy comes and whispers, go do this, fill your life with this, 
get busy with this, you can go, wait a minute, that's not what God has called me to do. I know his truth. That's not his truth. But how do we know that unless we've put on this belt of truth? How do we put it on? How do we put it on? Very simple thing. Very simple, yet so profound. You put on the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ. So profound and life-changing if we're willing to do this. Jesus, help me teach this moment like you gave it to me yesterday. This is so important for somebody to hear this morning. Romans 13, 14 says, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that we're commanded in his word to put on Jesus? Which means if we're commanded to put on Jesus, we can walk around without having put on Jesus. Are you walking around having put on Jesus or are you walking around Jesus not around you? Make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The verbiage here when it says to put on in, in the Greek is giving the imagery that what Jesus is wearing, his robe, is put on you. He wants to clothe you. He wants to dress you in who he is, his way, his truth. Have you put on the clothes of Jesus? Do people who are in your life recognize you as an image of Jesus? They look at you and go, there's something different about this person. They've, they don't just profess Christ. They actually live this thing out. They put on something. They're different. They act differently. They think differently. It's because you put on Christ. You put on Christ. I'm going to be very bold this morning, and I hope you don't get offended. I hope that the Holy Spirit convicts those who needs to be convicted and bring you to a place that God so desires because he loves you and he wants you, he wants you all to himself. There's some of us this morning in this room and watching online that you have professed Jesus with your mouth, but you have been, not been transformed by his grace. You have professed Jesus you got fire insurance, but you're not living out your life in a way that you've put on Christ. You're going throughout the day, and a day after day after day, and a Bible verse pops up and you get excited. You go through a mini devotion. You maybe even talk to God during the day. Have you gotten to the place where it says in his word, Romans 13, 14, that you put on Christ and there is no, no, no provision for the flesh? Because I'll tell you this, when you put on the belt of truth, there's no room for anything but the truth, but Jesus to be around your waist. If you are walking around proclaiming, oh, sorry about this, it's coming in heavy right now. If you are walking around proclaiming that I put on the belt of truth, yet you are not aligning your life, your will, your way, and surrendered it completely to Jesus, then you have made provision for the flesh. You have gratified your own desires. I have caught myself so many times recently as I've been trying to spend more and more time with the Lord. That's, that's my desire. That's my way. That's my thinking. 
Yet what you're doing, Jesus, is you're calling me to surrender all, all of that and make no provision for the flesh. Do you know the implications of this? How profound this is in this moment. Maybe I'm the only one receiving it. I feel it very strongly. God is speaking to me. I hope he's speaking to you. We must surrender everything to our Savior. When we put on this belt of truth and we wrap Jesus around our waist, there must be nothing else but Jesus. Why, and that's tough. You want me to give up what I want to do? You want me to give up my desire, my way of thinking, my way of, yes, yes. And it's not my desire, it's the desire of Jesus because he is our all in all, our sufficiency. And when we look somewhere else, we're looking for another truth, not in Jesus. Colossians 3, verse 2 and 3, set your minds on things above, not on things of the earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. For you have died. Have you died? I need to ask you very bluntly, have you made the decision to die to your desires, die to your flesh, die to your gratification, so that you can put your Faith, your, your desire fully on the things of Jesus. Set your minds on things above. This is where Christ is seated. Christ right now is seated at the right hand of God. So he's calling us to set our minds on heavenly things. Up where Jesus is, not on the things of the earth. Jesus is at the right hand of God in this moment. At some point, the trumpet will sound. Jesus will come back, but until then, the enemy who we fight against in spiritual battles is the ruler of this world until that trumpet sounds. So I'm going to say something else very bold as well. When it says, not on things of the earth, if you set your mind on the things of this earth, you have aligned your mind with the devil. It's Christ 100%. Or nothing at all. Are you there? Do you feel God calling you in this? Do you feel the Holy Spirit provoking something within your soul, within your heart and mind, that you've come to some sort of realization that if I'm truly going to call myself a Christian, if I'm truly going to put a belt of truth around my waist who is called Jesus, that I must get rid of of these other things in my life, these things of my flesh, these things of my desire, because they are not truth. The only truth is in Jesus, and I'm putting him on, and nothing else matters. Is this okay this morning? Jesus, I just pray right now for your revelation to come as has come to me over the past few weeks. Jesus, I pray right now that you would reveal yourself in a way that people have never experienced you before. Holy Spirit, provoke the hearts this morning. Let us turn to Jesus this morning. Jesus is longing for our attention. And it, I got I to gotta tell you this, it's not so that he can beat you over with the stick, guys. It's because he loves you and he has the best for you, but he knows the only best is found in him. So will you pick up this belt of truth this morning? Will you put it around your waist this morning? Not as, oh, I'm a Christian. I'm going to put on the belt of truth this morning. But truly, Put on Jesus in a way that everything else dies in your life. For then you, know, you, will, you will know the truth at that point. It is at that point you will know the truth, and at that point you will be set free. But if you're like, Jesus, you're good with my coffee. You're good at a midday prayer. You're good when I go to bed. 
and you haven't literally died to yourself and set your mind fully on him and put him around your waist so that you take him everywhere you go, that he literally holds everything in your life together. It is time, child of God, to come to that place this morning and to surrender everything to him. Everything to Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.